The Little Match Girl It was a bitterly cold evening. Flurries of snow filled the sky and covered the darkening village below this New Year's Eve. Oh, my sweet little child, I am so sorry I have to send you out into the frozen darkness to sell these matches this evening. But, as you can see, I cannot walk because I'm sick. Yes, Grandma, I understand. And remember, sweetheart, with the money you make from selling these matches, we can eat tonight. Otherwise, we will be forced to try and sleep with our stomachs empty. Now go, my child. Don't worry, Grandma. I will sell all the matches and we'll be sure to bring home lots of food as well. Goodbye. In this chilling darkness, there whisked along the cobbled stone streets a poor little girl who was nearly eight years old and an orphan. She had to cap to warm her head, and her clothes were all threadbare and nearly worn through in places. She walked with calloused and wounded bare feet, for she had no shoes. She stood on the corner, clinging hopefully to the matchboxes which she held in her thin, bare hands. People bustled all about her, busy with Christmas shopping, not even giving a glance to the poor little child. Sweetie, do you like what I bought you in that toy store? Oh yes, mother, the doll is pretty, thank you, and the dress is so lovely. The little match girl's eyes filled with tears. But there was no time to cry, for she must sell some matches so she and her grandmother can have dinner that evening. So she bravely wiped the grief from her eyes and said to the woman, Lady, would you like to buy some matches, please? They're very sturdy and nice. No, I don't need matches. Get away from my daughter. I don't know why they let these kinds of people on streets to mingle among decent people such as ourselves. Look at her dress, Mother. It's so old. I'm sorry, but these are the only clothes I have. It's not my problem. And besides, I don't have money. Even if I did, I wouldn't buy matches. So get away and leave us alone. But they're only one penny each. Don't you understand? I don't want it. Now go away, or I will call the police. The little match girl trembles. Snow begins to fall. Once more, as she presses on with her quest to try and sell matches to people passing by. Ma'am, please, would you like to buy some matches? They're magical, you know. When you light one, all your wishes will, will come true. That's nonsense. Those are fairy tales. But ma'am, please buy at least one. Its light will give you the most wonderful Christmas. I told you. No, I don't need one. It is true. Each one is different. I don't want matches today. Why don't you go home? It's a cold night. I can't, ma'am. I don't have parents. And my grandma is very sick. I don't have any money left to buy medicine or food for her. I do wish I could help you, my dear. But I do not have enough money to spare. Maybe somebody else will buy some from you. Maybe. Maybe. The little match girl's spirits began to sink as the cold winds became stronger and swirled round about her frail form, seeming to snatch at her with its icy claws. With a final blast of determination, the little match girl continued to offer her wares, but to no avail. 
Finally, feeling alone and defeated, she slumps down upon the sidewalk, shivering uncontrollably from the cold. My hands and feet feel like blocks of ice. I will light one of my trusty matches just to warm my fingers a little. The poor little match girl's hands were shivering so greatly that she was unable to light a match. After some time and great effort, she lights up one single match. And to her surprise, the matchstick transformed into an iron stove, and the little girl soon began to feel warm. She put her tiny, icicle-like fingers closer to the stove. She was very happy. But a few moments later, a snowflake dropped right on her matchstick and snuffed it out. So she stood up and once again tried to sell her matches. Alas, not a single match had been sold thus far. Suddenly, she heard a voice. Hi there, little girl. What do you have there to sell? I sell matches. Would you like to buy one? As soon as she turned towards the voice, she sees an old homeless woman standing in a corner with her skinny dog. They both are shivering with cold. Don't you see that I am as poor as you? Oh, sorry. I have to sell these matches to get some food for my grandma. Poor girl. Well, will you please take care of my dog for me? It will only be here for a little while. I must go and find some food. Perhaps I can bring some food for you, too. Well, at least I can get some food for my grandma. But please come soon, as I have to get her medicine, too. The little match girl agreed to watch after the dog, and the old woman left with a promise to return as quickly as she could. She held the dog's leash as he sat quietly on the corner. In a while, the poor girl started shivering again. She thought for a moment and took out the matchbox and burnt it against the wall. To her surprise, she sees a table full of wonderful things to eat with turkey, lamb, goose, fish, apples, and cakes. Oh, I wish I could eat it all. I feel so peaceful in this place. As soon as she reached for a piece of cake, the flame of the matchstick went out and everything vanished. She was very disappointed. She looked up towards the sky and prayed. Oh Lord, please take me out of this sadness. I'm so hungry and miserable. Please help me. Just then, she saw a star falling from the heavens, and she recalled something that her grandma had told her. Grandma says when a star falls, someone dies. My grandma is very sick. Does it mean that I lost my grandma? <gasps> oh, she loved me more than anyone else in the whole world. She took out another matchstick and lit it. She was surprised to see her grandmother standing in front of her. Oh, Grandma, is that you? Yes, child. I am here for you. The little match girl was pleased to see her grandma, but was rather alarmed, for she could see that her grandma was floating in the air. Don't be afraid, my child. I am safe and well now. You don't have to worry about me anymore. The little match girl opens her mouth to tell her grandma how hard she tried to sell the matchsticks. Then the flame of the matchstick went out 
once again, and her grandma disappeared. This time, the poor child lights all of her matchsticks at once, as she didn't want her grandma to disappear again. And the glow was so bright, it was as sunlight. Her grandma reappears and gazed lovingly at the little match girl, smiling. Grandma, I'm so scared. I don't want to stay here anymore. Please, take me with you. Yes, dear. I will take you with me. Give me your hand. Grandmother took the little match girl's hand, then lifted her in her arms. They both started soaring upward to the sky. How are you feeling now, my sweet angel? Oh, Grandma, now I feel wonderful. I don't feel hungry or cold anymore. I feel as light as a feather. Grandma smiled again, and they both flew to heaven. And in that same moment, a little star fell from the sky. The next day, when the sun was rising up again, the little match girl was sitting on the ground with all the burnt matches in her hand, and a contented smile resting on her face. Many people looked on at the little match girl lying lifeless upon the sidewalk. They all grieved for the loss of the bright light that her life was to them. The End The Little Tin Soldier Once upon a time, a toy maker fashioned 25 soldiers from a piece of tin. They all carried muskets, they all looked straight ahead, and they all wore splendid uniforms of red and blue. At last, when it came to the last soldiers that were made, there wasn't quite enough tin. The toy maker only had enough to give the soldier one leg. But that soldier didn't mind. He was very proud to be different. He was very proud of his one leg. He stood erect, carrying his musket, looking straight ahead in his bright red and blue uniform. The toy maker placed all 25 soldiers tightly into a box. Then. He carefully gift-wrapped the box. They were a birthday present for a small boy named Jojo. When the little boy saw the box, he let out an excited yell. Ah, tin soldiers! Thanks, Mommy! Jojo emptied the soldiers out on the floor and selected the last tin soldier for the duty of captain. Because he was different, and that made him special. Jojo placed him on top of the cupboard beside the toy hippo, where the soldiers could see. A brown teddy bear, a slinky dog, an astronaut, a box labeled Jack, a magnificent castle with a swan floating on a lake, and, standing at the castle door, was the most beautiful girl the soldier had ever seen. He fell in love with her because, like him, she only had one leg. I have never seen anyone so beautiful. Lucy? Yeah, she is. She is always on one foot. She is a determined ballerina. Oh, I am sorry. I did not mean to be rude. I didn't realize I was talking out loud. Oh, you are a really good soldier, humble and respectful. I am honored, sir. Thank you. Oh, one more thing. Since you're here, you should know. Jack in the box toy is tricky and mean. Thank you for your kind advice, Mr. Hippo. That's all he said to Mr. Hippo. And then he said to himself, I shall make her my wife. But what the soldier didn't realize was that the beautiful lady was a ballerina, and these types of dancers held their other leg high in the air to dance. And that's why he could see only her one leg from his position. Every evening at midnight, when the clock struck twelve, all the toys would come alive and they would play. The little tin soldier was determined that at that time 
he would visit the castle and ask for the beautiful lady's hand in marriage. But another thing which he was unaware of was that the jack in the box was also desiring the ballerina as a wife for himself. At the stroke of midnight, he began to hop in the direction of the castle. Firstly, he jumped from the cupboard, and with many hurdles, he finally climbed the table to reach near the castle. Suddenly, the lid of the jack-in-the-box popped open, and a frightening and hideous face jumped out and stared down at the little tin soldier. <laughs> I'm Jack. She's out of your league, soldier boy. And anyway, you only got one leg. There was a moment of silence between them. You live in a box. She lives in a castle. Give up. The little tin soldier looked up at the castle. The beautiful dancer had been watching him. She smiled. He started bouncing towards the castle. Tin soldier! Jack practically spat the words out with a fury in his eyes. Don't wish for something that doesn't belong to you. The tin soldier ignored Jack's ominous voice. Very well. Wait until tomorrow. <laughs> Bad things will happen. An ill wind will carry you away. And with a fiendish laugh, he disappeared back inside his box. I wouldn't take any notice of Jack. The little tin soldier glanced towards the castle and the beautiful lady. He lay down beside the lake, watching the Lucy. Finally, he drifted off to sleep. From there, the soldier could survey the whole room, and the lovely Lucy was smiling at him. So he smiled back. But he can't see Jack's box. Suddenly, a gust of wind caught the curtain. It flipped the little tin soldier backward out of the open window. While he was falling, Jack's words tumbled through his mind. An ill wind will carry you away. And he heard Jack's fiendish laugh in the wind. <laughs> the little tin soldier landed on the pavement. Then, heavy drops of rain started to fall. It wasn't long before water was pouring down the gutter beside him. What bad thing is going to happen to me next? He said to himself, as if in answer, two boys came running down the street. They thought it would be fun to send a little tin soldier out to sea for an exploration. They quickly made a small sailboat out of an old newspaper and placed him inside. They sent a boat sailing down the gutter. The little tin soldier shouldered his musket. He wondered, Will I ever see my beautiful dancer again? Large waves rocked the boat up and down. Suddenly, the boat dipped down and rushed into a drain. The little tin soldier trembled. He held on to his musket tightly. What on earth is happening? I bet Jack is behind this. Inside the drain, it was very dark. In the distance, he saw what looked like the headlights of a car. As the boat floated closer, the soldier realized that the two lamps were in fact eyes. The eyes of a huge, ugly water rat. It was the border patrol. He cried, Passport! The tin soldier remained silent. The water rat's hand reached out to make a grab for his passport. But the little tin soldier was too quick. He crashed his boat through the straw barrier and sped away. The rat gave chase. He screamed. Stop him! Stop him! He hasn't paid me his toll! He isn't got a pass! But the roaring water surged on. The little tin soldier could already see daylight ahead. Freedom! Freedom! I might still get home to see her smile once more. As the little boat rushed towards the daylight, the soldier heard a noise. It was a waterfall. The little boat shot out into the air. Way below was a canal. Mm, not again. Although he was frightened, he refused to close his eyes. 
The boat spun and swirled and crashed onto the surface of the water and finally drowned. The soldier was thrown into the thunderous water and everything went dark. He had been swallowed by a fish. As the soldier lay in the fish tummy for several hours, a flash of lightning struck. Then he heard a voice which he recognized. Oh my goodness, it's the little one-legged soldier! The fish that had swallowed him had been hooked, taken to the market, and sold to Jojo's mother. When she sliced it open, she found the little tin soldier. She carefully dried the soldier and then put him in the castle next to the beautiful dancer and left. The soldier sees her smile and his heart melted. He bowed down to ask her for marriage and sees her other leg. He got disappointed because he thought she could never say yes. But suddenly, he heard a soft voice. You are a Captain Tin, right? Yeah, yes, ma'am. I want to say something. Please, go ahead, ma'am. I love you since I saw you on that cupboard. Will you marry me? Little Tin Man was surprised, and he quickly said yes. But then the clock chimed midnight. Jack came out from his box. He was looking furious as rage filled his eyes. He quickly drew a sword from his box and said, I told you not to wish for what doesn't belong to you. Lucy is mine. Prepare to die. Little Tin Soldier rose up and put forward his musket, which had a bayonet. They started fighting in front of the castle, and suddenly, Little Tin Soldier put his bayonet in Jack's box and swing him back towards the burning stove. With a loud scream, Jack fell into the burning stove, and he burnt to his death. Little Tin Soldier and Lucy hugged each other, and they went straight to the palace to live. Then they lived happily ever after. The End The Little Mermaid A long time ago, there was a city under the sea named Atlantis. King Orin ruled and had one daughter. She was pretty. Not only was she beautiful, but the Little Mermaid could sing beautifully. Mermaids were not allowed to go up to the surface to see the world of humans until they were 20 years old. Each year, the little mermaid would plead with her father to be allowed to travel to the water's surface. Be patient, little one. Your turn will come. At long last, it was the little mermaid's 20th birthday. Towards the end of the day, her father turned to her and said, The time has come, my sweet child. Go to the surface of the sea and come back to tell us what you find. But be safe and stay away from humans. The little mermaid kissed her father, said goodbye, and began the long swim upwards to the surface. It was nighttime before she arrived at her destination. She saw a ship lit by hundreds of glowing lanterns. So she swam closer to the ship. And upon hearing strange and wonderful music, she just had to find out how these sounds were made. Looking through a window in the side of the ship, she saw what appeared to be a birthday party going on on the ship's lower floor and it seemed that it was for a young prince. He was the most handsome creature that the mermaid had ever seen, and it didn't take much for the gullible young maiden to fall in love. After a while, It's getting late. I must head home. She was about to dive, but suddenly there was a strange sound which she had never heard before. A storm. The prince's ship started to lurch and roll in the churning sea, and there were screams of terror as the sailors tried to save their ship from the giant waves. 
Then swiftly, the ship rammed on the sea stone and broke in two. Many lives were thrown into the sea along with the prince. The little mermaid knew that humans could not survive underwater. No, I will not let my love drown. So she carried Prince back up to land, where she tended to his wounds throughout the night. The prince was unconscious upon arrival to the sea's shore. So the mermaid laid the sleeping prince on the sand in front of a small church and cried for help. Then she swam to some nearby rocks to see if someone would come to his aid. The prince opened his eyes and saw a girl coming out of the church. When the girl saw him, she quickly ran back into the church to fetch some help. People came running. The prince was picked up and gently carried away. The little mermaid then swam back to her home. For days, she sat sadly by herself. But the little mermaid could not forget the prince. So she devised a foolish plan to swim off and be with the stranger whom she had given her heart to. The next day, the little mermaid called for their royal advisor, Sebastian the Crab. He soon came to see the little mermaid and said, Princess, how can I help you? Take me to Ursula, the sea witch. Sebastian yelped in surprise and exclaimed, <laughs> Don't you know who she is? She is an evil witch. Why? Then she told Sebastian the whole story of the storm, along with her plan to be with the prince. After a brief argument, Sebastian foolishly agreed to take her to Ursula. The sea witch lived in the darkest, coldest part of the ocean, and her house, which was made from the bones of drowned sailors, was guarded by poisonous water snakes. As the little mermaid and Sebastian enter Ursula's lair, the sea witch stood in front of her crystal ball, gazing into it and smiling fiendishly. Ursula, I have come to... Oh, my sweet little princess, I know why you have come. You want to marry a prince whom you've never met. You wish to lose your fish's tail. Fear not. I've got a potion which won't fail. So you can help me? My sweet child, that's what I do. It's what I live for. I can vanish your tail. But it will hurt, too. Just tell me what I have to do. Ursula snatched a dark-hued potion from her pantry with her tentacles. With this potion, you will be in two-legged motion. Give me the potion. Ursula smiled eerily and said, No, 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 no. To get the potion, I have one condition. Nothing comes for free. First, you pay me. But I have nothing. I'm only a princess with unlimited wealth. How can I pay? Your beautiful voice is what I need. Then you will be human indeed. Only three days you have. Remember this. The prince should fall for you and give you a kiss. Once you get your kiss, you will always be human, enjoying bliss. But if you fail to follow my tone, you will be sea foam. Very well. If that is what I must pay. The witch handed the little mermaid the potion, and her voice left her. The next day, the prince's servants found a beautiful young woman lying on the beach near the palace. They helped her inside, and when she walked, she seemed to be in great pain, as if she were walking on knives. The servants dressed her in fine clothes, and the prince came to see her. You were the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. What's your name? But she kept her silence, as this was the little mermaid. Although she didn't speak, she quickly became the prince's favorite. 
He never went anywhere without the little mermaid at his side. Before long, the prince told her how much he cared for her, and she thought her heart would burst. But I can't marry you because I'm still searching for my true love. He explained about the storm and a beautiful girl rescuing him, and how, after only getting a glimpse of her, had fallen in love with her, deciding that if he ever found her, he would marry her. The Little Mermaid was very sad, for she couldn't tell the prince that she was that girl. That she had given up everything, her tail, her voice, her family, just to be with him. On the second day, a king from another land visited the prince. The king brought with him his beautiful daughter, and when the prince saw the king's daughter, he recognized her. This was the girl who had found him on the beach. So he asked her to marry him, and she agreed. On the third day, the little mermaid thought her heart would break, for it was the same day her prince would marry the other princess. And when the sun set, she would die, just like she had agreed to with the sea witch. The wedding was to be held on the ship, so with a heavy heart, she attends, just so she can see the prince one last time. Earlier that day, the Little Mermaid's parents visited Ursula and threatened her. The cruel sea witch gave them a knife, explaining that if their daughter would plunge that knife into the heart of the prince, her spell would be broken. As the marriage was well underway, she went on the ship's deck to cry. And there, she saw her father and mother came upon water. They were sad. What have you done, my child? Her mother was crying. Quick, you can still save yourself. The witch has given us this magic dagger. Kill the prince, for when his blood splashes on your feet, it will grow into a tail, and you will become a mermaid again. Hurry, the sun is nearly rising. After her parents left, she ran towards the prince with the knife. She looked at him as he was happy beside his new wife. One blow with the knife, and then she would be free. She looked at the sharp dagger, then at the prince. She still loved him, so she went to the deck again and threw the knife far out into the sea. In the morning, the prince ordered his servants to search high and low but no sign of the Little Mermaid was ever found. The prince was very sad and would often sit on the beach late at night, missing his little friend. And sometimes he would look at the bubbles on the water shining in the moonlight and was almost certain that he could see her face. The End The Tale of Tom Thumb Once, there was a very old beggar who was wandering through the densely wooded forest. One day, when his feet were very sore, he knocked on the door of a one-eyed orc named Gogo and begged for a bite to eat. The orc, Gogo, and his wife, Gigi, welcomed the stranger into their cave. While his wife put some bread on a small plate, they realized that their guest was none other than Merlin, the greatest and most skillful wizard of all the realms. Oh, great Merlin, please accept our humble assistance. You both are very humble and generous. I am well pleased. Therefore, I wish to offer you anything you desire. He snapped his fingers twice, and then bubbles appeared above his head with images in them. Ah, the skadoosh! Shiny heaps of gold, sparkling diamond mines. Tell me, what do you wish for? Oh, I should be the happiest creature in the world if I had a son. 
Even if he was no bigger than my husband's thumb, I would be satisfied. Gigi gazed at her thumb in wistful longing. Merlin was so amused with the idea of an orc boy, no bigger than a thumb, that he decided to grant the poor woman's wish. And poof, there came a sweet little orc boy holding Gigi's thumb. The new orc parents felt utter happiness, and they thanked Merlin countless times. Soon after, the wizard departed from his humble host's dwelling. Tom never grew any larger than his father's thumb. That's why everyone called him Tom Thumb. Gogo and Gigi never let their very tiny son disappear from their sight for fear of losing him. They crafted a small toy house for him to live in. And as he got older, he became a very cunning and clever lad. One day, Gogo was getting ready to go into the forest to cut wood. He said to himself, I wish I had someone to drive the cart to me. Father, I can bring the cart all by myself. Gogo laughed and he answered, <laughs> Well, let's at least try. When the time came, Tom asked his mother to harness the horse to the cart. And then he sat in the horse's ear and gave him directions. So the horse went the correct way through the densely wooded forest. It happened that as they turned a corner, Tom was calling out, Gently, gently. Two humans responded to his cry of distress. One of them saw the horse and heard the voice, but couldn't see the rider. What an odd thing that is. There goes a cart, and the rider is talking to the horse. But still, the rider is not to be seen. They started to follow the cart out of curiosity, wondering what sort of strange magic this was. The cart drove directly into the forest, and exactly to the place where Gogo was working. Then Tom, seeing his father, called out to him. Do you see, Dad? I have arrived with the cart. Gogo took his son and put the boy onto his shoulder. The two strangers were looking upward all this time and did not know what to say, as they were simply flabbergasted. Then one of them rattled the other by the shoulders, saying with greedy excitement, We must steal the little orc. He would make our fortune. People from all over would pay to see a little freak like him. We'd be rich, rich, I tell you. So they hastily disguised themselves by covering with branches and leaves. When Gogo was taking a shortcut through the woods, they gingerly grabbed Tom by putting a hand over his tiny mouth and swiftly stuffing him inside their satchel. And just like that, they slipped away, cloaked in the shadows of the tall pines of the forest. Help, Dad! Help me! Tom was shouting, but no one could hear him. The two strange kidnappers journeyed onward till dusk had begun to fall, and Tom requested with urgency in his voice, Will, will, will you please set me down? I need to go to the bathroom! Don't you fool us, piggy boy. We know you just want to escape and run away, right? No, sir. But if you doubt me, then I suggest you tie me with a thread. They agreed to bind the boy in a thread. With one end tied to Tom and the other tied to the human's hand, they released him and allowed him to relieve himself. Tom nimbly slipped into a mouse hole and cut the thread with his strong teeth. The men stuck their sticks into the hole, but it was all in vain because Tom crept still farther into the hole. As it became darker and darker, they were forced to give up in frustration. After a while, when Tom realized that his kidnappers were gone, he crept out of the hole. As he was walking, he heard two goblins chatting together about how to rob his father, Gogo. 
He then came out from the shell and disrupted their scheming with cunning cleverness. I could tell you how. I can slip through the door of the cave, then into the safe, and I can get you as much gold as you want. What do you say? <laughs> and why would you help us out like that? Hmm, what's in it for you, you little thing? I would get my fair share of the loot, of course. <laughs> yeah, why not? Let's go then. Goblin carries Tom atop his head, and off they went. As they approach Gogo's cave, Tom slipped through a tiny little crack in the cave and opened the door for them by pulling a small lever that his father had specially made for Tom. The two goblins entered the cave, their eyes gleaming with the glitter of greediness. They double-checked to make sure that the orc couple were sleeping and proceeded to stealthily traverse to the treasury room. As the goblins began to selfishly stuff gold into their satchel, Tom closed the treasure room door by pulling yet another lever, trapping them inside. He called out, Dad! Dad, come here! I have captured robbers! Both Gogo and Gigi wake up, with a smile dancing across their faces as they hear their son and run towards the sound of his sweet voice. My little Tom has returned! The whole family cried tears of gratitude and joy at the reunion of their family, as well as the safety of their belongings. Gigi then picked up her son Tom and kissed him. Soon, they heard the whispering of the two would-have-been thieving goblins from the treasure room. <laughs> hey, tomboy, come on, open the door. Your share of the treasure is here, just waiting for you. Um, Tom, you there? Can you hear me now? The whole orc family laughed at their intruder's predicament. And then, Gogo went to teach them a lesson and beat them good and hard. Soon, Tom could hear the goblins crying for mercy and in fear of their lives. When Gogo finally emerged from out of the treasury room, two goblins were swinging upside down in his tightly fisted grasp. And Tom felt so very proud to be the son of such awe-inspiring parents. From now on, we will treat you as the orc treat another. I am proud of you, my son. The End The Snow Queen Gerda was a young girl who lived with her grandma. Her fiancé lived next door. His name was Kay. Between Gerda's house and Kay's, there was a small walkway. Gerda and Kay planted red roses there as a symbol of their eternal love. They always talked about getting married. Then, on Winter's Day, they were sitting beside their rose bush when Gerda's grandma cried. Look, the Snow Queen is gathering her flakes. Gerda and Kay rushed to the window. Kay looked at the Snow Queen through the window and stuck out his tongue. Don't do that, Kay. What if she sees you? She might come after you. Then he climbed through the window and back to his bedroom, which was in his house, which was right next to Gerda's house. That night, Kay was getting ready for bed. A walk towards his window and peers out. He spots a unique-looking snowflake and finds that it's rapidly growing larger and larger until it became the Snow Queen. She held in her hand a plate of sweets called Turkish Delights. Kay couldn't resist. He snatched a handful from the plate. As he shoved them greedily into his mouth, the lady grabbed his wrist and pulled him out of the window and onto her sled. Her team of horses suddenly took off. Kay should have been very frightened, 
but the sweets had dulled his sense of discernment and alarm. The next morning, when Gerda came to visit Kay, he wasn't there. She looked everywhere for him. She raced down to the village square, and she cried, Have you seen Kay? Have you seen my Kay? But no one had seen him. Nobody knew where he had gone. Don't let my Kay be dead. Please don't let my Kay be dead. I don't believe he is. Gerda looked up, and there sat a little sparrow. When we're searching for the food we set high on the rooftops, we see everything. We would have seen him, unless he fell in the river. I'll go and ask the river fairy. A tiny spark of hope lit up in Gerda's heart. If he drowned, the river fairy will know. So she went near the river and shouted, River, river, did my Kay come by here? Did he fall in your deep waters and drown? And the river fairy came up from the water with a sweet smile on her face and said, Oh, my sweet child, no, your Kay didn't come down here. Now don't cry. Where is he then? I wish I knew. But there is an old witch who lives beside my shore. She might be generous to you, but you have to be cautious about her. I will do anything for my love. Can you please take me there? Why not? Just hop in that little boat. My streams will lead you to the witch's cottage. The river fairy then disappeared, and Gerda hopped into the boat. The little boat floated on, with the current getting faster and faster. Then Gerda saw a small cottage. An old lady came hobbling outside. She was bent over and carrying a walking stick. The old woman walked to the edge of the river, caught the boat with her walking stick, and drew it into the land. She helped Gerda out. Although Gerda was afraid of this strange old witch, she was totally determined to find Kay again. Come and tell me who you are. Gerda told her everything. Have you seen my Kay? No, but perhaps he might come by. They went inside the cottage. There was a bowl of beautiful cherries on the table. Don't be sad now, Goethe. Your love will find a way to you. Now, eat those cherries. While Gerda was eating, the old woman combed her long hair with a golden comb. As she combed, she whispered, I have longed for a granddaughter like you. Gerda forgot about Kay because the old woman had cast a spell on her through the magic comb. The old witch wanted to keep Gerda as her own. After a while, Gerda murmured, I will stay here forever. But one day, while in the garden, Gerda noticed the red roses. They reminded her of Kay. The memory of Kay broke the old woman's spell, and Gerda raced to the garden gate. She ran till she could run no longer and stopped at the stone bridge. Suddenly, she was surrounded by trolls. Trolls rushed forward, seizing Gerda. She is fat and pretty, and she has been fed on nuts and honey. How nice she will taste. She shall play with me. She shall give me her muff and her pretty dress. The little girl troll, who was about the same age as Gerda, wore a mournful look on her face. She clasped little Gerda around the waist and said, They shall not kill you. I will protect you. All the trolls laughed and agreed to give Gerda the little troll. Gerda explained her story to her, how fond she was of Kay, how she must find him. After they ate and drank, they were walking below the stone bridge. Above them, more than a hundred pigeons, who pretended to be asleep, watched and listened to them. We have seen Kay. Where? 
in the carriage of the Snow Queen. Where were they going? Lapland. The Snow Queen has a castle there. Little Girl Troll looked serious, nodded her head, and said, I'll help you to get your love. The Little Girl Troll went near to her pet, the reindeer, squinted her eyes, and said, I will untie your cord. You shall run fast and carry this sweet girl to the castle of the Snow Queen. Help her find her Kay. Then the little troll girl cut the string of the reindeer, and away Gerda and reindeer flew. He ran on until he reached the Snow Queen's castle. There he set Gerda down. You must go on alone from here. I will be here when you come back. I will make sure you and your love will get home safely. Gerda walks there, outside the tall ice castle of the Snow Queen. She was suddenly surrounded by thousands of snowflakes that fluttered about her. They were the Snow Queen's guards. Gerda prayed. The cold was so great, she could see her own breath. It poured like steam from her mouth. As she continued to pray, the steam appeared to increase until it took the shape of little angels. By the time Gerda had finished her prayers, a whole legion stood around her. They attacked snowflakes, and the battle began. Gerda hastened onward to the Snow Queen's castle, and she found Kay deep within its icy walls. Kay, my Kay, I have found you at last! Kay was almost frosted over and blue from head to toe, for he had become so addicted to Turkish delight, he no longer felt anything else at all. All this time, the Snow Queen had fed him that sweet, sinister, and powerful spell. Gerda hugged him and wept hot tears that fell on his chest and penetrated his heart. They melted the ice which had become Kay's heart. Warmth returned to his body. He recognized Gerda and cried joyfully. Gerda, where have you been all this time? Kay, I was looking for you, my love. I found you at last. They clung together, laughing and weeping for joy. The loyal reindeer was waiting for them. Upon seeing them approach, he knelt down and allowed them to climb upon his back. They flew home with joy and gratitude dancing in their eyes. Soon after, they got married and lived happily ever after. The End The Magic Grinder Long, long ago, in Egypt, there was a poor maiden named Naur. She worked for a greedy lord by the name of Anubis. While he sat in the shade all day, Naur and her nephews worked in the garden. Naur picked fruits and vegetables, while Ra and Seth pulled and cut the weeds. At the end of each day, they brought their basket of food to Lord Anubis and he would put the heavy basket on the scale. Hmm, not bad. But whenever Naur asked for her pay, he always shouted, Come back tomorrow! So Naur had no money. Without money, she could not buy food for her nephews. One day, she went to the cupboard, and it was empty. I will go and ask Lord Anubis for some food. Nauer went straight to the Lord's house. He came to the door himself, rather than one of his servants. What do you want? I'm a very busy man. Nauer peeked into his dining room. When she saw the delicious food, she was hungrier than ever. I only want a little food. My nephews are very hungry. Food? I don't have enough for myself. He lied. Go away. Poor Nauer. Away she went, without food for herself or her nephews. On her way home, Nauer had to pass a cave. 
Suddenly, she heard a strange moaning and groaning. It was coming from inside. I wonder what that could be. It sounds like someone is hurt. It was a serpopard, stuck under some stones and hollering loudly in pain. Nower was afraid at first, but after listening to his cries for help for a while, she felt pity and was no longer afraid. So she called to the serpopard. What can I do to help you? These rocks are too heavy for me to pick up. The serpopard pointed to a shelf in the corner. It was filled with beautiful treasures. Take down the golden grinder and bring it here to me. Nower handed the grinder to him. Watch and listen. He began to turn the handle. As he turned, he said, Golden Grinder, help me, please. You will know just what I need. As soon as he said those magic words, a shovel was standing beside him. All by itself, it began to dig. It lifted the heavy rock. Suddenly, another shovel appeared. It started digging, too. Then came another shovel, and another, and another. After some time, all the shovels completed their work. The serpapard said, Golden Grinder, stop and stay. The grinder stopped making shovels. At last, the serpapard was free once again. Because you have helped me. I'm going to give you this magic grinder. Just say the magic words, and it will give you anything you want. Oh, thank you. The serpapard waved goodbye to Nower. Now don't forget the magic words to make the grinder stop. (laughs) It won't stop unless you say those exact words. I won't forget them. Away she ran to show her nephews the wonderful magic grinder. When her nephews saw the grinder, they were not very happy. Where is our food, Aunt Nower? We will have food. Listen. Nower began to turn the handle. Golden Grinder, help me, please. You will know just what I need. Suddenly, the table was covered with food. There were turkey and ham, mashed potatoes, peas and carrots, fruit and cheese and milk and bread. Then, Nower said, Golden Grinder, stop and stay. The Grinder stopped making food. Then, Ra cried, Oh, Auntie, let's ask for new clothes. Nower said the magic words, Presto! There were dressed in fine new clothes. Then Seth said, Let's ask for new furniture. When Nower turned the handle and said the magic words, the grinder gave them fine new furniture. Then Ra and Seth cried together, We are rich! They bounced up and down on their new bed. Just remember, never tell anyone the magic words. Next morning, Nower and her nephews did not go to work in Lord Anubis' garden. Nower stayed home to plant some flowers. Seth and Ra went fishing at the stream. Lord Anubis soon came to visit and find out why Nower and her nephews had not come to work for him that day. He was surprised to see their new things. He cried in surprise. All of this can't be yours. Where did you get everything? It's a secret. I can't tell you. If you don't tell me, I will go to the king. He will throw you into the jail for stealing. 
Nower showed the grinder to him. I did not steal anything. This grinder gives me whatever I want. Lord Anubis snatched it away from her. I'll take care of that for you. And he ran straight home. He put it down and turned the handle and said, I want some gold, please. Nothing happened. Then he shouted angrily, I want gold now. Still, nothing happened. Then he said, I will find out how to make it obey me. Off he ran to find Nower's nephews. As for Nower and her nephews, they never went to work for Lord Anubis again. Nower sowed in her own shady garden. Seth and Ra spent their time fishing, and the magic grinder gave them everything they needed to live happily ever after. Lord Anubis found Seth and Ra fishing at the stream. My dear fellows, I hear you have a grinder that gives you anything you want. Tell me, how does this magic grinder work? It's easy. You just you just say, Golden Grinder, help me please. You know just what I need. And out comes whatever you want. Seth quickly poked his brother. He whispered, That's a secret. Ra did not say another word. Very interesting. Now he knew how to make the grinder work. He ran towards his ship to flee from the village so that no one can take his magical grinder. He could hardly wait to try it again. So he began to turn the handle into the sea. I should test it first. For now, I'll ask for a little salt. In his greediest voice, he said, Golden Grinder, help me, please. You know just what I need. Sure enough, the grinder began to make salt. Then it made more salt. Now his boat was filled with salt, and it became so heavy, so he cried. Stop it! Stop it, oh grinder! Hey, stop now! But he did not know the magical words, so the grinder did not stop. Soon, his ship started sinking because of the weight, and finally, the ship and Anubis drowned in the water. But children, do you know? That magical grinder is still running and making salt, and that is why seawater is so salty. The End The Fish Prince Once upon a time, there was a king and queen who had two sons. The older of the two was very short and ugly, with only one eye that resided in the middle of his forehead. His younger brother was tall and handsome and carried himself like a prince. The king played favorites and decided to make his younger handsome son, his heir. My people will never obey a midget with only one eye? This made Disa, the older son, very angry. The kingdom must be mine, or it should have been divided. Matni, the enchantress, who was Disa's wife, determined to get the whole of the kingdom for her husband. She hosted a banquet and invited the younger brother. She then said to her husband, After dinner, you must sit with your brother on the balcony overlooking the river. I will change him into a fish, and then you can throw him into the water. Then we shall be rid of him. Disa agreed to this, and after dinner, invited his brother to sit with him on the balcony. Then, Matney threw some powder on the younger prince's head. Just as soon as she did this, the prince was changed into a little fish, and his brother picked him up and tossed him into the river with a laugh of wicked triumph. This all happened so suddenly that the prince hardly knew what happened to him. He flailed all over the place before he struck the river's swift current. 
When he finally realized that he had been transformed into a fish, he swam very gracefully in the water's depths. He realized that Matinee had enchanted him, and he wanted to get as far away from her as he could. So he swam until he was beyond the realm of his father's kingdom. Then, one day, he was caught in a net by some fishermen and taken to the palace of the king of this unknown land to be served up for dinner. He was not a very big fish, and the chef thought it would be much better to keep him as a pet than to cook him. I will take it to the queen's room. She has no children. This little fish may amuse her. The queen was very much pleased with the pretty little fish and became very fond of him. Several days passed, and he grew to be too large for the bowl. So she had another one prepared for him. He is such a dear that he shall be called Neo, the fish prince. After a few days, the fish prince grew so big that the queen had to have a tank made for him, through which the clear water of the river flowed in and out. Then one day, the queen feared that the fish prince was not comfortable in his tank, so she asked him, Are you happy here, Neo? After pondering for a moment, the fish prince replied, I am quite happy here, dear queen mother. But if you could get me a nice wife, I would be happier. It is really quite lonely for me here, all by myself. The answer astonished the queen, but then she did not know that he was a fish only in appearance. Now the queen looked upon the fish prince as her own son, and never imagined that any girl would have the least objection to marrying him. All right, I will find you a wife at once and have a room built in the tank for her. She had the room built at once, but it was not an easy matter to find a wife for the fish prince. Everybody knew that Neo was a pet of the queen's, but beyond that it was pure gossip. The townsfolk even said he was a monster of a fish and that all he wanted a wife for was to eat her. But the queen sent messengers far and wide among the rich and the poor alike, but found no parents who were willing to give their daughter as a wife to the fish prince. Then the queen offered a large sum of gold to any father who would send his daughter to be the fish prince's wife. But nothing came of it for a long time. At last, a fakir heard of the large offer of gold and said to the messenger, You may have my eldest daughter. She can't be much worse off than she, where she is now, and the gold will make me rich. Where is she? She's down by the river washing. She's my first wife's child, and her stepmother makes her do all the hard work and will not give her enough to eat. She gets more than she deserves, much more than she deserves. You're welcome to take her. We will be glad to be rid of her. And if the fish prince wants to eat her, fine. So the messenger gave the bag of gold to the fakir and went to the river, where he found a very pretty girl washing clothes on the river's bank. She cried very much when she heard what his duty was and begged him to let her say goodbye to an old friend before he took her away. Who is this friend? The queen said we're in a hurry. It is a seven-headed cobra whom I have known ever since I was a little child. Still crying, the girl ran along the bank and the cobra put his seven heads out of the hole where he lived. I know all about it. Don't cry. Pick up those three pebbles outside my hole and put them in your dress. When you see Neo coming, throw them first at him. If it hits him, he will sink to the bottom of the tank. When he rises to the surface, hit him with a second rock and the same thing will happen. Throw the third pebble at him and he will transform from a fish 
to a prince. He isn't really a fish. He is the son of a king and is under an enchantment. But you can break the enchantment in the way that I have told you. So Maya dried her tears and went away with the messenger to the palace, where they showed her a beautiful little room that had been prepared for her inside the tank where the fish prince lived. The queen kissed her and said, You are just the dear little wife I want for my Neo. She let them put her into the little room where she sat down and waited for a long time with the pebbles in her hand. Then there was a sound of rushing water and of waves dashing against the door. She looked out and there was a huge fish swimming towards her with his mouth wide open. I want to see my wife. Open this door. Trembling from head to foot with fright, Maya opened the door and threw the first pebble, which went right down his throat. He sunk like a stone, but in a minute or two came up to the surface again. Then Maya threw the second pebble, which hit the fish prince on the head, and he sunk the second time. Maya was so nervous that she nearly missed hitting him with the third pebble, for it only touched the tip of his fin. This time, he did not sink, but changed into a handsome prince. You have broken my enchantment. Now we can enjoy sunshine and happiness in the world above, and need not live in a tank any longer. So, they were drawn up out of the water and taken to the palace, where no one could possibly live happier than Maya and the Fish Prince ever after. The End The Magic Little Pencil Noah got off his school bus and stepped out on the street in the little town in which he lived. He never imagined that this would be the weirdest day of his life. He was walking on a crosswalk when he saw an old man shivering from the cold and looking very hungry and begging politely for food. P -p -p Please help me. I haven't eaten in two days. Can you spare a little something to eat? Noah felt pity for the old man. So he went to a nearby shop and bought food, as well as a bottle of water for him. He gave the shopkeeper the money which he had been saving up to buy a new pencil box for himself. It wasn't long before he was walking up to the old man. Here, this is for you. Oh, thank you, dear boy. I thought I was going to starve to death. That is so kind of you. After eating the food and drinking some of the water that Noah had kindly brought him, he began to feel better and turned a proud gaze upon Noah. I've been searching for a kind-hearted person for a very long time. I do believe that my search ends today. Noah was confused when he heard this, so he asked the old man politely. What do you mean? The old man reached into the satchel he was carrying and pulled out an antique box. He looked solemn and reverent as he slowly opened it to reveal its contents. Inside rested a very old pencil, which was shining as a bright little star. Noah was astonished by this sight. Suddenly. The old man abruptly closed the rusty lid, handing it to Noah, and says to him, Noah, yes, I know your name, for I am a wizard. I have been on a very long quest, seeking out a boy such as yourself, who would be willing to put aside their own desires in order to help others. Now, you can help others with this magic pencil. Just draw whatever you wish, and it will appear in before you instantly. 
Oh, wow! Thank you, kind wizard. Now I can help people in need whenever I want. This is great! Thank you so much! Just remember these two things. Don't tell this secret to anyone, or else they may steal it from you. And secondly, if you need my help at any time, you can just draw a picture of me, and I will be there in an instant. Don't worry, wizard. I will remember your instructions. Suddenly, in the blink of an eye, the wizard disappeared, and Noah excitedly continued his journey home. Noah couldn't wait to try out his magic pencil. So he draws a cake, and presto, it was instantly in front of him, sitting on a silver platter. The next day, he started to help each and every person he could find that needed something or other. He was walking down the road when he saw an overworked bellhop from a local hotel trying unsuccessfully to carry an overabundance of heavy and awkwardly shaped luggage. So, to help the young man out, Noah draws a baggage cart for him in order to ease his heavy burden. Then he saw a little girl who was barefoot and trying to sell matches, and no one seemed to care. But Noah did, and he proceeded to draw a basket of food along with some cozy slippers for her. After a while, he saw some homeless people shivering on the cold, hard street. So he drew some small but beautiful houses for them to call homes of their very own. That's how Noah chose to help the people around him. One day, when he was helping a poor man, the greedy and selfish mayor saw the kind and helpful boy. The mayor also saw how the little boy Noah was able to make all these things appear out of thin air with a simple yet magical pencil. The next day, the mayor ordered some policemen to arrest the boy for the illegal use of magic towards the unfortunate, because the law that the mayor had made only allowed the use of magic for the wealthy people of the land. The police found Noah using his magic pencil for all to see, magically helping those less fortunate than himself, and arrested him on the spot and dragged him off to present him to the mayor. He said, Noah, I saw how you helped those sick, hungry, hopeless, homeless, and poor people. Now you must help me. Draw me what I want. A tree that produces fruit of solid gold. Sir, with all due respect, I only help poor and needy people, and you're neither poor nor needy. It's not a request, Noah. I am ordering you to do so. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, but I will not do this. Then be prepared for a severe punishment, you stupid boy. The mayor then demanded his servants to snatch the magic pencil from Noah. One policeman successfully did so and gave it to the mayor. Now, the mayor began to draw a tree with golden fruit. It was a nice picture, full of colorful detail, but the magic within the pencil didn't respond to him. He then handed the writing utensil over to the policeman, who also tried, but failed as well, to conjure up anything from his stick drawing of a horse, which he had scribbled on a fresh sheet of paper. The policeman commented to the mayor, I think the pencil won't take any orders from us, sir. It only recognizes Noah's hand, so only the boy can fulfill your wish, Mayor. The greedy mayor was furious. Noah, I'm asking you for the last time. Are you going to draw me golden fruit tree or not? Choose your words wisely, they may be your last. Noah was a brave boy, but at this point, he only wanted to end this whole fiasco. So he said he would draw something, and the mayor handed the boy the magic pencil. The next thing Noah draws is the picture of an old man on the piece of paper, and the wizard who had given the clever and kind boy the magic pencil 
came to rescue Noah. As soon as he appeared, the old man turned those policemen into cats, and he said, Don't you dare try to misuse the magic of this pencil for your own greedy endeavors, Mr. Mayor. Otherwise, you will be the next one who will lick his own tail. The mayor was greatly frightened and shivered with fear. Then the old man admonished the mayor not to be so greedy and selfish. The mayor also acknowledged his wrongs and apologized to Noah and the wizard. The very next day, the mayor rewarded Noah for his kind deeds and acts of helpfulness for the whole townspeople to see. And Noah continued to help those less fortunate and lived happily ever after. The End The Magic Bell Once upon a time, in a small village, lived a poor boy named Pooh. He lived with his mother and younger brother. Pooh lived in a small hut, which stood right in the center of the village. To earn a livelihood for his family, he used to graze cattle with some of his friends near the mountains, and in the evening, returned them to their respective owners. Every day, while the cattle went for grazing, he loved to sit under a tree and play melodious tunes on his wooden flute. Hey, Pooh! Why do you always play your flute at this very spot? I don't know. I love this tree, and you may think I'm crazy, but I feel like this tree is alive and listens to my music. Oh, you're right. What? You think so, too? No! I meant you're right that I think you're crazy. <laughs> but Pooh was right. The tree did listen to his music. The music had touched the tree's spirit. It would listen to the tune intently and be happy to have Pooh play it every day. One day, as Pooh was slumbering on one of the branches of the tree, there was a terrible noise beneath him. Ah, what's, what's that? Oh, earthquake, earthquake! There was a woodcutter cutting the same tree where Pooh was sleeping. Who is this man? Phew, this will take some time. Pooh soon understood what was going on and quickly climbs downward. Hey, what are you doing? Why are you cutting this tree? My master would like to use it for his boat. This tree is very strong. No, you can't cut it. Really? And why is that? Listen, I've spent many days trying to find strong support for the boat. And you don't own this tree, so don't waste my time. Pooh will soon have to do something to save the tree, or it will be too late. So he used his cleverness to try and scare the woodcutter away. He said, Well, you can't say I didn't warn you. It's bound to happen, I suppose. What's that supposed to mean? Uh, don't you know? A spirit of an old witch lives in this tree. She's been staying here for years. If you cut this tree down, she'll latch herself onto you, of course. Latch? Latch onto me? Why? Isn't it obvious? Since you're the one cutting down this tree? Are you trying to fool me? I'm smarter than you think, boy. I'm not going to fall for this story. Go away now. Pooh was desperate to save this tree. As soon as the woodcutter got busy, Pooh climbed up and went straight to the top. He hid in the dense leaves and began to scream. Ah! Ha ha ha! How dare you touch my home! What? Who is that? If you destroy my home, I will come to live with you, and I will never leave you, human. The boy was right. Don't worry, human. We will be good friends. <laughs> the woodcutter began to run as fast as he could. What's the hurry, my friend? 
just as Pooh was laughing at the woodcutter, the tree came to life. Pooh! Pooh was shocked to hear someone talking to him. Are, are you really the spirit of an old witch? <laughs> no, Pooh. I am not an old witch spirit. I mean, I am old, but I am the spirit of this tree. Your music brought me to life. You are a cunning boy, Pooh, and I am grateful to you. You saved me from the woodcut. Suddenly, a nice golden bell appeared in front of Pooh, which was floating in mid-air. Here, accept this as a thank you gift. A bell? Not just an ordinary bell, my dear. This is a magical bell. Every time you ring it, the plate will magically fill with delicious food to eat. Oh, wow! This will really help me and my family! Yes, it, it will, but remember, Pooh, you can only ring this bell once in a day. I will remember that. Thank you, dear tree. Pooh ran to call his mother and brother in the village. Mom! Ronnie! Come here and look what I've got! He shared the incident with them. They were very happy to see the magic bell. They wished for their favorite foods, rang the bell, and ate to their heart's content. Afterwards, they went to bed with their tummies full after a long and delicious meal. The next morning, as usual, Pooh took the cattle out to graze on the pasture, leaving the bell at home. When he came back in the evening, tired and hungry, he found all the pots empty. There was no food left for him to eat. Pooh was saddened and just ate the leftovers that he found in a cupboard. Still being hungry after his meager meal, he went to bed. He couldn't sleep due to his tummy growling of hunger. So he decided to take the magic bell with him the next day. When his mother and younger brother were hungry later that day, they looked for the bell. They searched the entire hut from top to bottom, but couldn't find the magic bell, which made them very sad. They thought that they had lost the bell. They had neither the bell nor food. They went to bed on empty stomachs. When Pooh returned home in the evening, he took out the magic bell from his satchel. He ordered his most favorite food. His mother and younger brother were very sad to see this. His younger brother started crying, and he said, Brother, we're so hungry, and we kept looking for the bell. You have become so selfish. How could you? Hearing this, Pooh realized his mistake. He regretted his decision, but he also shared with his honest thoughts. You asked the bell to give you food, but you forgot to save some for me. I was tired and went to bed hungry and it hurt my feelings, so I was sad and angry. His brother and mother also realized their mistakes. They ate their meal together as a family that night. And from that day onwards, they never slept with empty stomachs and lived happily ever after. The End The Snake Prince Once upon a time, there was an old woman who lived by herself in a city in India. She was very poor. One day, she went down to the river as usual to wash, taking with her a small brass pot, which she used to carry water back to her hut. But when she lifted the lid off to fill it, there was a glittering, deadly snake inside. She thought, I will take this snake home with me and let it kill me there, for I am so poor and alone and I long for death. When she reached her hut, she tipped the pot on the floor. 
But to her surprise, instead of the snake, a magnificent necklace fell out. She picked it up and hurried to the palace to offer it to the king. When the king saw the necklace, he bought it from the old woman at once to give it to his queen, whose days were filled with sadness because she had no children. The queen was delighted with the beautiful necklace and locked it away in her jewel chest. Sometime later, she wanted to look at it again. But when she opened the door, she found to her amazement that the necklace had disappeared and in its place was a baby boy who sat on a silk cushion smiling and beaming happily at her. Oh, how sweet! I've always longed for a baby. This child is the loveliest jewel more than any necklace that's ever been made. The years went by, and the boy grew into a young man, whose beauty and wisdom were praised by all. His parents started looking for a bride for their son, and eventually it was arranged that he should marry a beautiful princess from the neighboring state. Now, the old woman, who had sold the necklace to the king, had been given the position of a nurse to the young prince. She loved the boy dearly, and in her foolish pride, she could not help boasting a little to the other servants that there had been magic in his birth. This rumor spread, and it reached to the ears of the prince's bride. Filled with curiosity, she resolved to find out the secret as soon as she became his wife. The prince spoke tenderly to his bride, but she did not answer him. She was silent for a long time while the prince pleaded with her to speak. At last she said, Tell me the story of your birth, my prince. The prince was filled with dismay at her request. If I tell you, you will be sorry that you ever asked this question. For many months, their lives continued this way, each one growing sadder and paler because of the secret that lay between them. At last, the prince could bear it no longer and said to his bride, <sighs> At midnight tonight, I promise to tell you my secret, but you will regret it all your life. The princess was so happy to hear this that she paid no heed to his warning. That night, the prince ordered his horses to be saddled, and little before midnight, he rode with his princess down the river. By its bank, he stopped and asked in his infinitely sad voice, Do you still wish me to tell you my secret? Yes! Then I will tell you. I am the son of a king of a far country, but by an evil spell I was turned into a snake. No sooner had he spoken the last word then he sank to the ground and disappeared. The princess heard a rustle and saw in the moonlight a snake gliding into the river. She called to her love to return and searched everywhere for him, but the night held its secret, and her prince did not return. When the king and the queen found her in the morning, she was weeping, and her long hair was flowing loose. Her feet were cut and bleeding from the stones that she had stumbled on in the night. All she asked was that they build a temple of black stones on the riverbank, where she would live alone and moan for her prince. Years passed, and still the princess waited for her husband to return. She never left the temple, and the guards who watched her never allowed anyone to come inside. Then one morning, when she awoke, she found a stain of fresh mud on the pillow beside her. She asked the guards if anyone had entered the room while she was asleep, but they had seen no one. The third night, the princess determined to stay awake and watch, so she cut her finger with a knife so that the pain would keep her from sleeping. At midnight, she saw a snake come gliding along the floor with mud from the river still clinging on to its skin. It came up to her bed, raised its head, and then sank down on the pillow beside her. Who are you and what do you want? 
I am your prince, your husband, and I have come to see you again. The princess began to weep, and as he watched her, the snake went down. At last, didn't I tell you that you would repent your curiosity all your life? Oh, yes, I have repented at all these years and I have been alone, Prince. Is there nothing I can do to bring you back again? Yes, there is one thing. If you are brave enough to do it, you must put a bowl of milk and honey in each of the corner of this room. All the snakes of the rivers will come and drink the milks and the one that leads the way will be the queen of the snakes. You must stand in front of her and say, Oh, queen of snakes, queen of snakes, Give me back my husband. But if you are frightened and do not stop her, she will keep me in her power forever. And you will never see me again. With these words, the snake glided away and disappeared into the river. The following night, the princess took four bowls of milk and put one in each corner of the room. She stood in the doorway, waiting. At midnight, there was a great hissing and rustling from the river, and presently, the ground was covered with the writhing forms of snakes. Their eyes glittering, and their forked tongues quivering, and reached forward as they moved towards the princess. They were led by the huge, hideous creature who was the queen of the snakes. The guards were so frightened that they ran away and left the princess alone standing in the doorway. She was deadly white, but determined that she would not run away. When the leading snake came within reach of her, she cried, Oh, queen of snakes, queen of snakes, give me back my husband, please. But the queen of snakes moved forward until her head was almost touching and her small evil eyes seemed to flash fire. Still, the princess stood in the doorway and again she cried, Oh, queen of snakes, queen of snakes, give me my husband, please. Then the snake fell back and hissed. Tomorrow you shall have him. When she heard these words, the princess sank fainting into her bed. The next morning, the princess took off her moaning dress and put on beautiful clothes again. She filled the temple with flowers, and when night came, she lit the garden with lanterns and the temple with candles. At midnight, the prince came to her from out of the river. She ran to meet him, and they embraced with greater joy and love than they had ever felt before. The old king and queen wept with joy too, and commanded that feasting and rejoicing begin. The old woman, who had been the prince's nurse, was far too old to do anything for the children, but loved them. And the prince and the princess ruled the land for many years with love and wisdom in their hearts. The End <laughs>